Good evening and welcome to the Ferguson Library. I'm Alice Knapp and I'm the CEO. And I know you're not going to listen to a word I say because there's some real excitement going on here. But while I'm talking, this is a great opportunity for you to silence your phones. I won't say put them away or anything like that. This is too exciting. We're going to want to be on social media and stuff. But we're going to have an outstanding evening tonight. This is a really big deal. Um, and this is a big deal for Stanford. This is a big deal for the Ferguson Library. I, I can tell you the staff here has been a buzz all day. Um, and, and we're very excited about tonight. But one of the things that you may not realize, because you're so excited to see Tamron Hall, um, is that this is actually a fundraiser for the Friends of the Ferguson Library. Yeah. And while I can wax poetically for about 35 minutes on what the Friends do, the key is they're the secret sauce that makes this a great library. Every child born in Stanford receives a book when, um, because of the Friends of the Ferguson Library and the fundraising that they do. On May 5th, we have our literary competition award ceremony for children in grades the three through um, 12, four different categories. We've done this for over 35 years and it's always 400 to 500 submissions. And they, they manage that whole process, something that we couldn't ha take on. They are just the secret sauce. So. I am going to introduce you to one of our board members. I just quickly want to tell you that tonight we have the Domestic Violence Crisis Center in the back. Please stop by. They're a very important partner organization of the library. Another one of our major partners is Elm Street Books. They are here selling additional copies, and you'll probably want to pick up a couple more copies. Um, we're Diver we're um, veering from our regular format tonight. So if you have questions, um, write it on a piece of paper. We'll be around to collect it. There's paper and pencils in the back. And with that, I want to introduce you to Cynthia Taylor, one of the board members of the Friends of the Ferguson Library. So I get the pleasure of introducing Tamara Hall to us. It's here in Stanford. And I did want to add, I know probably nobody was paying attention when you went to get your goodies, but on the back screen, we are profiling um, things that the Friends of the Ferguson do as fundraising activities. And hopefully you'll come out and join us at something else that we host. So without further ado, um, Tamara, a two-time award-winning journalist and author, Tamara Hall is executive producer and host of the nationally syndicated talk show, Tamara Hall. As a veteran journalist, Hall leans into her more than 30 years in the field to ask the tough questions while having engaging, thoughtful conversation. Tamara Hall is currently the second longest running Disney produced syndicated talk show and continues to be one of television's highest rated daytime shows, consistently delivering standout moments that become central to the cultural conversation. Mrs. Hall 2021 debut novel as the Wicked Watch is the first installment of her critically acclaimed Jordan Manning mystery series with a highly anticipated, or actually, you know, Watch Where They Hide, her second book, which was released 2024. Um, it's a mystery series with a highly anticipated, with someone they knew with Tamron Hall and which returned to the second season in 2023. A national, a native of Ludland, Texas, Hall holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in broadcasting journalism from Temple University, where she serves on the board of trustee. She currently lives in New York with her husband and son, Miss Tamara Hall. <laughs> now, I'd like to um, introduce our moderator, Emerson Coleman. Um, he will be moderating this evening. Mr. Coleman serves as Senior Vice President Programming for Hearst Television until 2022 after 32 years with the company. Among the industry's most highly regarded programmed executive, Mr. Coleman oversees the company's program development and acquisition. 
Mr. Coleman has been honored with the national and regional awards from organizations, including the National Association of Broadcasters, the National Association of Television Programs Executives, the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, and the National Association of Black Journalists. He created the series as executive in charge of production of the weekly national political talk show, Matter of Fact, with Soledad O'Brien. Welcome our guest this evening. Hello. Hi. It's so wonderful to be here and I'm super excited. I'm nervous. I can tell I'm not used to I'm used to interviewing and not being interviewed. So I am nervous and I'm sorry we were late. We did um a live show today and a tape show. Um and so then we got caught in I don't know, that's not they need another word for we <laughs> We're in a library, so Denise, perhaps you can tell me a different word from traffic, because that was not traffic. That's that's a thunderstorm of cars or something or other. But I'll, I'm sorry, Emerson. Well, welcome. <laughs> have Have you been to Stanford before? I've been, but you know, I I taped someone they knew uh, two seasons here, but it was always a weekend, and they would pick me up at like 4 a.m. in the morning. And we would stay inside the studio. So 4 a.m., there's like one, it, I got here in 15 minutes, like one car. And it's a different time at 4 p.m. But I'm so honored to be here and to see your faces and to walk in and get the warm greeting. I hadn't eaten anything. And the beautiful staff was like, wait a minute, we got cheese bread. We got crackers. We got, I was like, we're going to go inside. They were like, you need to eat something. I chew a lot of gum. They had like 15 packs of gum. I was like, oh my God. So it's wonderful, warm welcome. And thank you again. A very warm welcome. It was 67 degrees today. Oh. Every every winter in Stanford is just like this. Really? Yeah. I've come more often. I to set up shop here. Well, let me say, your intro could have gone another 20 minutes. Oh. You have accomplished so much. Uh, it would not have been complete after 20 minutes even. Thank you. So, how in the world do you find time to write two books? What is that process like? <laughs> well, I'll start with saying the reason why I do have a busy schedule is because of this wonderful man. Emerson Coleman was the very first executive to bet on the Tamron Hall show. I um, was going around telling people after I was no longer at the Today Show that I had this idea for a talk show. And um, Emerson brought me into a huge office meeting, the biggest table and biggest spread of food I'd ever seen, and sat me down at the table with a number of other executives and really commanded and demanded they they see me and show respect and reverence for what I'd accomplished as a journalist for 30 years and listen to the idea. As you know, many times when you walk into the room, people make assumptions and the door closes before it's ever open and you don't see the door because it's an invincible door, but you feel when you're shut out of the room and you ensured that that was not going to happen. And I made my pitch and the show was purchased by Hearst when Emerson was there and then Disney and ABC followed. So that is the full disclosure and truth of that matter. Right. So I am busy because of you. And thank you very much five seasons later and two Emmys because of you. Um, thank you. So I, you know, the first book, honestly, um, I started to pitch this idea or play with this idea of writing and people uh, approached me about memoirs and some folks said, you know, what about like books of inspiration? Because I talk a lot about my faith and my journey. And even honestly, there were pitches about um, the fact that I'm a, I call myself a late to the party mom because I was 48. I think I was late. I was the after after party at 40. I was, I was late to the after party <laughs> um, with my son. And so I, I just I toyed around with the idea. And then March 13th, four years ago. 
and every, everything shut down. And we were in communication. The show moved into the basement of my home. Um, we have a, a cottage on Long Island. And I'm like, and it is a cottage. I mean, like, I'm not trying to be modest. It's like, get out of my way. Kind of. um, so we're in the basement doing the show. And I said, you know, I've been wanting to write a novel. And everything in my head said, write a novel? You don't, what, what do you mean? You don't write a novel. You do a talk show. You're a journalist. Write a novel. I, I often talk to myself and sometimes out loud. So please forgive me. And so I'm going with this. And then, like, you know, once we realized that things were going to be tough but okay and that the world was not going to end, you know, we went from believing we were all going to be zombies to, okay, this is, we'll survive this, but there'll be some tough times ahead. It gave me great perspective about taking your shot, you know, trying something new, stepping out of the lane. Um, I'd become very, very bored with my husband and his same stories over and over because you know three months in you're like okay <laughs> you've binged everything because there's no new tv and you're like when are we gonna get out of this <laughs> and so my mind started racing and then one night i fell asleep i woke up after watching espn the michael jordan thing i think it was and the name jordan came to my mind and then manning so i had her name jordan manning okay so i've got your name what are you what do you do and truly, there'd been a number of cases that I actually covered from Deadline Crime, which I had for six seasons, Someone They Knew, which we taped here, and 30 years of being a local reporter before I ever got to the national stage. I'd had a lot of cases that were still living in my soul, people's names I could never forget, the circumstances behind what happened to them I could never forget. And I didn't want to relive them in a true crime real version. So I thought, Jordan Manny, fiction. I got you. And it just started to pour from me. Um, but having that, you know, that opportunity of reflection in life, as we all did about perspective and what's important and scared to run out of time and try something new. I mean, there were people who were like doing DIY there were people changing their whole homes around. I remember everyone was crocheting and it was like, and I was like, I'm not a crocheter. I can't do that hobby. And then it was born. So once the idea was there, it just started to go and the first book was released um, and then I was stunned by the the, the love and, and, and affection for this character and that the critics, you know, because mystery and thriller world is a really tough world to enter. And so we just kept going. I was so inspired by the idea of doing it. I write, you know, early in the morning, we tape the show and we just figure the space out. I know that was a very long answer, but I do a talk show. It was excellent. Excellent. <laughs> you do do a talk show. I'm a horrible interview. I know. Do a talk show. <laughs> by the way. And you have been very generous. Thank you. Thank Let me say, most people probably don't realize that over 90% of all new shows are canceled. Mm -hmm. They're canceled in the first year. Do, do not make it to year two. And this fall, you will enter year six. six. Congratulations. <laughs> so did the writing flow easily? It's clear mm -hmm. you're very good at it. Or, or was it was it challenging because it was so personal? You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, there are two ways to look at it for me. Um, the ideas flowed because each book is inspired by cases that I've covered. So the first book, um, there was a young girl, Ryan Harris, uh, in Chicago, who was 11 years old, who um, <clears throat> had been murdered at this scene. And it was one of the first stories I covered in Chicago. The thing about Ryan, there were many, many wonderful things about her as a child that I got to know. But right before I moved to Chicago, I lived in Dallas, Fort Worth, and I covered Sandra Patterson, another 11 year old girl who had been murdered in the same year. You know, my life had taken me from Dallas, Fort Worth to Chicago, and their ages were the same. One happened to be black, one happened to be white. The difference in the, the, the way the stories were covered and all of these things. But to me, and, and I'll be I, I, I'll be so honest with you in this. They broke, I was not a mom then, but I felt in this strange way, this incredible attachment to both of them. I remember like crying over their pictures. And um, in the first case, she was missing for some time and her brother was taken as well at, from their home, from their beds. And when they found her brother, he, he said the name of the killer. He said, find Bobby Woods, this little boy. He had the presence of mind. He said, find Bobby Woods. Bobby Woods was the mom's boyfriend and the mother um, 
it's a very complicated story. And, and he was since sentenced to death in the state of Texas. And that she was still missing. I was in a vehicle with uh, my cameraman, Chris Mathis, who's still one of my dear friends. And we were sitting there waiting, um, listening to scanners, because, you know, back then they would have scanners. And like my grandma used to have one on her refrigerator. She's like, did you hear the neighbors next door? And like, hey. <laughs> so we had scanners like that. So I'm listening to the scanner and I'm waiting because I know she's going to be found. They found him, her brother, they'll find her. And the newsroom or someone called in and they said, they found her. So I was like, oh, Chris, they found her. And they said she wasn't alive. And um, I just, I blacked out. I'd never met her, never saw the picture. And I was like, I don't know if I'm cut out to do this. I don't know if I can do it. Then I go to Chicago and I cover Ryan. And it was even just worse set of circumstances. Two little black boys had been accused of murdering her. They would have been the youngest kids in the history of America charged with murder, except for they didn't do it. And they were taken in and they were um, treated poorly. Um, and it wasn't until much later that DNA evidence cleared them, but it was a butterfly effect because they never recovered their lives. They were babies that never recovered their lives. So these stories like lived in me and I said, okay, I, I just have feelings about them. And, and through Jordan, maybe I can create this character of fiction and tell what it feels like to be a true crime reporter. And so that was the intention of it. And that's, so her, her part, I, it's not the word easy, but it was relief, right? Because I could share with you what's it like. And so in the first book you see, she's opening up in front of this field and that was where Ryan was found. And then through fiction, I can create this world. And, and through escapism, I could also put in a little humor. And in this book, you see she's investigating um, the missing, this disappearance of this woman, Marla, while also planning her best friend's wedding and her best friend's a pain. So that was like the escapism. Because if I do dwell in the sea of darkness too long, I won't see the light. And so I, I, it's like climbing out of this, this hole. And so Jordan allowed me the ability to now add these little things about her that made it fun to write, but also allow me to exercise out or excise out these things that are so troubling when you are a true crime reporter that you are supposed to pretend you that don't have an impact on you. Did you know the ending to both novels before you began or did, yeah. did it come to you as you continue to write? For some reason, the first ending came very easily. I kind of knew which way I wanted to, to wrap that up. The second, I really wanted to scare the crap out of you. <laughs> I really wanted you to think, sorry, Denise, I know I'm in the library. I'm sure there's a thesaurus around here. Okay. <laughs> but um, there, um, I, I wanted to gain the respect of thriller and mystery writers. I wanted to gain the respect of the readers of that genre. So I really knew I had to play with it. And I had to find, you know, I said, okay, well, this isn't easy. And okay, no, no, wait a minute. Oh, oh. And, and when you're coming up with a thriller ending, you have, it has to make sense why it's so complicated. You just can't say, well, an alien then came down. It's like, what? You know, so with the ending and because Jordan has a forensic background, so she's a journalist, but unlike myself, she has a forensic background and this is the pull for her. You know, she really, loves the job of reporting. She um, loves and, and appreciates the role and the power of a microphone and how you can change things, but it does limit you. When you're a reporter, you're in a box, right? You know, if the sign says, do not enter, I just can't go in because I'm a reporter. There are laws that you can break as a reporter as well. And I needed her to have the credibility of a real reporter. So I poured that experience and some of that, that trauma and pain that I just shared with you, but I also needed her to have superpowers and her science is her superpower. And she's able to dissect these things and get in there in a way that, I mean, I made C's and D's in math. I mean, I, I'm kidding, Denise, I'm kidding. I'm not, and so I give it a B minus sometimes, I'm just kidding. Um, but she had this science background and, and that's what causes her. I mean, she is, she really is a vigilante. And I'm already starting to write the, the third book. And, and, you know, in one end, I, you see her, she's a reporter, and soon she might be an anchor, and she's toying with that. In my mind, I'm toying with, is she going to become a full-blown vigilante? You're already writing the third book. <laughs> in addition, 
let's talk about Jordan Manning, the TV series. Oh, yes. And I see some people from uh, from ABC in the audience. Oh, my God. I know they'll sit up in their chairs. <laughs> um, there's some rumors. Yeah. Who's going to play Jordan Manning? I've heard a couple of names you can comment on. Oh. Angela Bassett. Oh, I wish. Listen, I so wish you. I wish she would. I mean, she was on the show yesterday. She did take the book yesterday, though. And I was like, I thought she was just being polite. She was live on our show. And she goes, oh, no, no, I'm taking this book. And I'm like, yes, ma'am, Queen of Wakanda. Who's going to say no to the Queen of Wakanda? Go ahead and take that book if you want it. Um, you know, I, I, I would be happy to see it in any form. Each book is meant to be freestanding. So for me, I wanted you to be able to read both or one. I, I want her to be this, what I envisioned was that relationship you have with someone you meet for the first time and you feel like you've known them forever because you know they're a good person. You know, you, you get that feeling you're like, I know they're a good person. I feel like I already know them. And so it was important that you see her compassion, you see her drive and you see her wanting this career, but also not being seduced by it. As you know, in television, there are people um, who just want to be on TV. They just want to be on television, and that's the prize. And then there are others who want it and see it as a vehicle to help, to change, to impact, and to, to elevate. Um, and, and you notice the difference immediately in her, and that's why I was intentional about putting in newsroom scenes. You know, In the first book, there's a conversation that I'd had many times in my newsroom about how you fairly cover the disappearance of people um, of different races, of different backgrounds. And she's in this newsroom having this moment. You also see the glimpses of misogyny that exists in every place. We know that. And, and, I, and I say that very carefully because I, I tell people all the time, I, so I wouldn't be who I am without the great dad that I had who served in the military for 30 years and the phenomenally sassy and bad cook of a mom that I love so much. <laughs> and they made a dynamic duo. My dad was 25 years older than my mother. And I know that man, uh, <laughs> you think he's a Hollywood actor, um, but no, the most beautiful relationship ever. And, and so, but in my life, my dad prepared me in so many ways to be able to stand up to these, to these forces and you see this in Jordan standing up in ways that my dad told me I could, but I was also fearful. I mean, she's in her 30s and she's a lot more vocal in the newsroom than I was, even though I had been armed by great parents to be so. But, one, you know, it's one thing to tell your kid, you get in there and you tell them. And then, you, you're, then you're without your parent and you're like, where's my backup? I can't do this. Or I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to suffer the wrath of being too vocal. And so there's a scene where she's in the newsroom and she's really standing up for herself. And there's one in, in well, many in the book, but one in particular where they're talking about a suspect and how do you describe a suspect? And when I got in the business in the nineties, um, I remember having this confrontation with a news director who's no longer in the business. <laughs> <laughs> He's no longer in the business, but I remember, um, you know, there was a, I was, it's like 1996 or so, and there was a suspect, a robbery suspect, and it, you know, it said five, four, black male, and it's like, you know, medium bill, something very generic, and I was a reporter in my hometown of Dallas, Fort Worth, which was such a point of pride, you know, my parents had a chance to watch me on the local news, and then I would go home and have Sunday dinner, you know, I was like, to be, and our, I, from a, it's a medium to large size market. Dallas is not a small market. So I'm young. I'm in my local markets. I took a lot of pride in those four years that I was there. So I told my news director, you know, this could be anybody. This could be my brother. This could be five, four, black guy in a jacket. Like, that's anybody. And he said, well, that's what police told us. And I said, but they don't have anything else on him? And he said, nope. And so you might remember way back in the day, you would turn on the news and the description literally would be somebody's height, somebody's weight. And then if you were lucky, they'd say medium brown skin. And you're like, whoa. And that's because, you know, I, I'm so happy to see our industry improve and advance, but that's because around the world, I didn't know there were other young reporters 
in the business saying the same thing to their news directors. So I'm in Dallas for worse. Somebody else is in Flint. Somebody else is here. You know, all challenging the system. You know, and I saw it as well as a woman in the industry, that same news director. <laughs> it was a hot day in Texas, um, 105,000 degrees. And I was covering the weather. And, you know, it's the type where they would crack the egg and the egg sizzles. That's how hot it was. So my assignment was to do that cracking of the egg to scare you all into not coming outside. I had a white um but I'll never forget a white button down that I got from Ross Dress for Less. I had a black blazer on and it was sweltering and my hair wasn't this short. So now I'm a full Afro and I go to take off my jacket and he's in my ear and he said, put your jacket back on. And I said, but Jim, oh, said, said guy who's not in his business anymore. I said, it's 112 degrees. I mean, I, I'm outside. Where I was in front of the bank when the bank used to have the digital thermostat, right? And he said, no one's going to take you seriously. And I said, do you think they think I'm serious? I'm out in the sun cracking an egg and I have a black blazer on. And I went back to the newsroom and he lectured me about how I was going to be taken seriously. And what he was saying is, to be taken seriously, you have to dress like a man or what, what, the, what the, the news standard of that. Um, you had to do this. I mean, I was lectured about the length of my hair. You know this in the business. You've been in a long time. And these Not things were real. Not hair anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Good second time. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just disrespecting on. you over here. <laughs> this is like, but you know, they used to like bring you in about your hair. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the things. And so in Jordan, I give you a glimpse of a moment in time. It's a lot better now. Um, but still, there are moments where I talk to journalists and I'm like, they still do that. But you, you've seen it from different vantage points and you see it in Jordan. And I write about these things. So it is a thriller. It is a crime novel, but it's a glimpse into what it's like for some reporters, particularly what it's like for me. Like Jordan Manning, you love fashion. You think? You love fashion design. <laughs> Where did that come from? Oh, I, it's my mom and my family. You know, I grew up, um, my grandfather was a sharecropper born in 1901. And I'd say I make my living with words that he couldn't read. Um, he was not able to read. Um, and I would always, though, when I would go to Luling, I'd see him and he'd just have his you know, his Stacey Adams on, his hat, and he would go to church and this little teeny church on this dusty road. And you were looking at men and women who farmed and were house cleaners and all this. And then on Sunday, they would just be magnificent. And so that became a part of, you know, I never got a chance to meet my grandma. She died when my mom was 10. But whenever I would put a hat on, you know, my grandfather would say things like, you wear a hat just like her. Like she, nobody could wear a hat like her, you know? And he, it was just a point of pride in presenting yourself. And so when we started the um, talk show in particular, I was like, you know, fashion is our weapon. I want people to feel good when they see me. And I listen, it's about, again, 500 people to do this, but it was, uh, it was important particularly as a black woman, um, I have to be honest, that we were able to present this um, positive side of the journey. And that also means how we present ourselves. I mean, we, I'm sure many of you are parents in here. And, you know, one of the things I love now is that next year, my son is going to go to a school where they have uniforms. So I'm like, but you straighten up. But because because I went to Catholic school, I grew up in a uniform culture. And I, I, I always like the idea of, you know, presentation and, and, and giving people an opportunity to obviously always see your heart, but also see that you care. And it's not a dollar figure. It's not a, you know, I, my aunt Lottie Mae, that's how country I am. Lottie Mae uh, used to work at Dickie's uh, Manufacturing. Um, where now, you know, people now it's cool to wear Dickies and the jumpers. 
wasn't when I was. And so, but my mom would have me in my little Dickies work pants <laughs> because after Catholic school, I went to a public school and I had my little painter's Dickies pants and shirt, you know, and ironing all night long. And so it's just, it's always been a part of it, but it comes from that, that spirit of people like my grandfather and, and folks who really cared greatly about how they present it to the world. In, in the acknowledgments, hmm. the first two people that you referenced were your very talented husband, Stephen, <laughs> and your amazing- Well, that's because I forgot them this. in the first book. No, I did, I, this is a true story. I do, the first book they're not in. And my husband said, you didn't, you didn't mention this. I sat here the whole pandemic with you in this book. Because I would like wake up in the middle and I go, oh, I know, I'm going to write this down. And he's like, can't you go to sleep? I'm like, no, I've got another chapter. I was like, because some of it is romance in, in Jordan's life. And I'm like laughing. Kind of he goes, are you writing about an ex while I'm sitting right here? So in the first book, I said, I want to thank my family. You can read it. And he filed a complaint in the husband wife box thing that we have. We have a suggestion box on how to be a better spouse. And so I go in, I'm like, oh, that's a suggestion. Thanks. So that's why they get the first shout out in the book. I, I wish I could have a more eloquent answer. It was solely because they were just passed over the first time. Apply them with chocolate chip cookies. Oh, listen, I do. Oh, yes. They they are. I, I was just saying on the way here, my, my son's at a birthday party. Well, hopefully he's on by now. Jeez, he's four. But he was at a birthday party after school. And I was so proud because he... Uh, is eating cake. Now I'm a sweets person. I eat, it, you, I will tear down a whole thing of sweets. And Emerson knows I can sit and eat. When you have me in the meeting, I was just eating the cookies. They were talking about my child. I was like, mm -hmm, it's going to be great. It's going to be free cookies. They had the best cookies at that meeting. So um, <laughs> I know I've got like this. Um, but I just got a picture on the way in and my son was eating cake, which was so exciting because he doesn't eat sweets. He, his favorite thing is curry chicken and dumplings. He does not like cake. So I didn't want him to be the weird kid at the birthday party and not eat cake. Or I'd be assigned as the mom who doesn't let the kid eat cake. Like, oh, really? Shouldn't let him eat cake, of course. I'm like, no, no, we love him to eat cake. So he eats the cake and, and it's the birthday. And I talk to him. He goes, I can't wait for my birthday party. I'm going to stand in front of my cake and I want everybody to sing to me. And I'm like, that's what they do at birthday parties. <laughs> it's like, okay, you stay. But I'm like, you, that's what you want? You know, to humor this kid. But no, I did. They they both love chocolate chip cookies. And in fact, um, you guys think you already know. I sold a cookbook, which is going to be out in September. Um, it's a love letter to my father. I didn't cook um, at all. And my dad passed away in 2008, um, which is why the book is in, based in the time period of 2008, because it was a big transitional year for me. So in the Jordan Manning series, it's 2008, 2009, because it was this uh, eruption of, of change for me and my family. Um, with my father passing away and he did all of the cooking. And I would jokingly say, I never had a meal cooked by a woman until I went to school cafeteria. Cause I, my mother was like, cook what? <laughs> and the one thing she cooked, she had this awful sweet, I don't know what it, she stole. She was a teacher and she stole it from another teacher's recipe, you know? And then she's like, I made this. I'm like, no, you didn't. You got, cause they would do like potlucks at school. And she totally, I guess it would be plagiarized somebody's recipe. And they claimed it as our own. Um, and so when he passed away, we knew we were going to miss, uh, obviously, everything about my dad. Um, but we, I went home and we had a holiday and there was nothing. And my dad was like the two hams, the two turkeys. You know, he was going to have sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie, this, that, blah, 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 pecan pie, everything. And we had nothing. And so I said, I'm going to figure this out. Just like with this book, I, I, in my life, I find myself, you know, playing with ideas of how to remind yourself that life is this book and how do you keep writing your pages and whatever those pages are. And they're small things and they're big things. And in that moment of great pain and absence of my dad, I found a way to, I thought I was empowering myself. I say, okay, I'm going to learn to cook. So my dear friends of mine uh, gave me a gift card to this cooking class, the cooking class, except wasn't a class. You just sit and watch them and they go like, I didn't cut this. I got to watch this on TV. And so the lady said, I'll tell you what, go buy all of the Barefoot Contessa books and just practice, practice, practice. Do it like she says the first time and then improvise the second time. I was like, all right, great. And then I just started practicing and I started reading Ina's books. And, and then as luck would have it, 
I ended up meeting her and then she invited me to her home in the Hamptons and we cooked. And then I started building my confidence and the book is called confident cook. And then I went on to the year, a year later, I cooked the entire Christmas dinner for my family for good or for bad. I tried. And then now I probably cook dinner four or five times a week. So the book is a love letter to trying build. It's, it's twofold. It's a cookbook. It's like 83 recipes, but it's also about building your confidence and, getting out there and doing whatever it is, you know, and in this case, it's cooking. It's been a remarkable journey. You have achieved yeah. so much. Thank you. Let me ask you about um, one big decision you had to make. Was it, was it scary, a little scary when you left NBC? Oh, no, no, it was not. No, it wasn't scary. It wasn't scary in the sense of, I thought I was, wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't as scary because I knew there was something else, you know, it was scary in, in the sense of, mm, it wasn't, none of it was scary. You know, it was a Tuesday. I'll never forget. Um, and I, I knew that they were preparing to make a change and I had received a text message while on air from my then agent, then agent, <laughs> mm. <laughs> my then agent wrote me a text message and he wrote it. It was very, very long. And I, it's like the Robert De Niro thing where they say, I made you an offer I want you to refuse. I, I knew that the idea was for me to refuse the idea, uh, this, this thing that was going down. And I, I wrote back and I still have it. I said, I'll pass. And I don't even remember my last hour on TV. It was like, whoa, what had just happened? And I was live. I went home, I prayed. And with great confidence and great calm, I said, let's see what the next chapter of this book is. I don't know what it is. Let's see what the next chapter um, and I knew that, uh, going back to clothes, which plays a through line in my life, I went in, I pulled all of these clothes out because I truly wanted a fresh start. I called housing works, which is a phenomenal organization that helps people who are living with HIV and AIDS and they raise money through their clothing. I packed up everything. And I said like that, remember that I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. Sorry. Another hair reference. Emerson. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm going to wash it right out. So I donated huge portion of my work clothes. And then it was like game on. And it was uh, great. I, you know, I, I, I've said before, people would call and, you know, I said, I, two types of folks would call. There were people who act like somebody had died, you know, like, oh my God. And I was like, well, who died? I just lost a job. I've worked since I was 14. But, you know, I read a book many, many years ago, since we're in a beautiful place where beautiful books are written. Um, that a woman gave me when I was 18, Mrs. Foy, Georgia Foy's mom, a friend of mine. And it said, who are you if there's nothing beneath your business card? Just your name. And so, and it would say, visualize just your name on the card. Who are you? And I was like, I'm Tamron. And that's enough. And she's going to figure it out. So your next chapter, oh. like the chapters of these books has been extraordinary. So congratulations, Tamron Hall. Thank you so much. And there are uh, a number of questions from the audience. Oh, yay. Now I'm extra nervous. <laughs> Ooh, these are written down. These are intense. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. I like long walks in the park. <laughs> oh. My favorite thing is cheesecake, but but I don't like the fluffy one. I like the thin one. <laughs> no, this one's about hair. Oh gosh. <laughs> we've we've spoken about your writing. Yes. Uh tell us what you're reading now. Wow, that's funny enough you should say that because I um right now <laughs> I wrote read the interrupting chicken. It's a little children. Thank you, Denise. I knew we were friends. It's a, it's a popular book in our house. It's called The Interrupting Chicken because my son has an issue with interrupting. Wonder where he got it from. And so the big read in our house is it's all about teaching a kid not to interrupt. And so <laughs> The Interrupting Chicken is a, it's a tough read. It's a tough read. <laughs> and we were last reading uh, Noses Aren't for Picking because we were, <laughs> there's a book. <laughs> the book for everything. You thank you. You know the book? Yes, noses are not for picking. It's a big read in our house. Thank God we're past that. 
we just crossed that dark side. So <laughs> it's not a pleasant one. That's been the hardest habit. Oh, but I'm sorry. I wish I could have given you something more profound. <laughs> really what we're reading right now. <laughs> the next question is, how do you beat the obstacles of being a Black woman in the field? Well, you know, that's a, a question uh, that's asked in many different ways. And, and I try to be as transparent as I can in answering it, because there are days, obviously, that you, you feel invisible or you feel um, not understood or not uh, seen equally. But I am always ever so mindful of if I keep looking at the bumps, I don't see the road. And I remember when we launched the show, there was a very, very, very famous anchor who came to me who uh, said, oh, gosh, you know, you're launching a talk show. It's going to be horrible. And, and I'm at this party and she didn't mean it in a negative way, but she was rolling out all of the bad things that could happen. And before I knew it, I said, my grandfather was a sharecropper. This is nothing. And so I just look at it that way. And so that doesn't mean I'm I'm oblivious to it. But, you know, if you're driving and you're just looking at that bump and not the road, you don't move forward. So I have a very forward facing, of course, when I'm with my friends or we're talking or when I'm with the young women that I mentor, we discuss it, but I also try not to let them stay down in that conversation because your, your wings can't fly if you're just looking at the dust that's on them. And I need to just, I have to flick the dust off. I got to move. I got to get high. I got to get high. I got to get high. And then I got to go forward. Thank you. I'm going to merge these two questions. There's one I did not get to ask. Uh, and it's uh, very similar to one of the questions that came from the audience. Mm -hmm. You've long been an advocate for victims of domestic violence. I'm sorry. You, you've, you've long been an advocate for victims of domestic violence. <laughs> Can you comment on the reasons for the continued increases in intimate partner <laughs> violence? And it just comes from someone in the audience who uh, shares with us that her son is missing and she has not been able to, uh, has not been successful in her search for them. Please share any expertise or help in any way that you can. Well, first, I am so sorry. I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself, but I, I appreciate um, that. That is, um, that's an enormous question. And I, and I want to be as honest and authentic as possible in answering that because I truly, I wish I had an answer. And I can tell you when my sister was murdered um, in an unsolved crime, I remember vividly I was, it was a Sunday, I was at home and uh, my dad wasn't a big crier. He kind of like fell into those stereotypes about that. But he called and I could hear something in his voice and he said, call your mom. Something's happened to Renata. I said, what do you mean? He said, call your mother. It was very brief. Um, I called my mom, she was on her way to church and she was just crying she, he, and she said, we've received a phone call um, that something has happened. She's driving, so I got up and I called my dad back, and he said, <clears throat> because my dad, I was always the, the like the kid who, I mean, surprise, surprise, I was kind of bossy. And so my dad said, um, I need you to call down there, find out what's happening down there. I'm in her home, and I called, and an investigator happened to answer the phone, and he told me that, you know, some of the details of the situation, and he said, we pretty much know who's done this. We're going to call you, you know, and so few hours pass, we call and he said, well, we, we know who did it. We're going to start questioning people. Blah, blah, blah. So we have to go through the funeral. Um, and I haven't shared a lot of this, but this part, we, we had to go to the funeral. The person was there. Um, and all, it was just, just as, as it was like a movie it truly was. Um, and, uh, you know, all of this was, and maybe that's even by the watch where they hide. Cause this person literally was in, front of me at the funeral. And as time went on, detectives eventually told us that they were not able to provide enough evidence that this, because it is an intimate partner. And that set me on this journey of working uh, with organizations, uh, like I was here speaking, um, uh, Safe Horizon and Day One to talk about the fact that um, it is an epidemic 
It is a crisis. It impacts everyone's family in some capacity. I've spoken in front of big groups. Um, men are victims of domestic violence. And we know children and women, uh, socioeconomic, doesn't matter. We're all impacted by it. And I feel that there are phenomenal people on the front lines that will and can offer as much help as possible. So I would absolutely start wherever you live to know that there are organizations. So if you don't feel that the authorities are there to hear you or help you, I will meet with you outside privately and give you whatever context that I have. Um, people ask me about my sister's murder and they say, you know, well, don't you want to do more? Have you ever wanted to do the story? And for us, it's different because we know, right? There's no, there's no shocking ending to this. We know, um, do we want him to go to jail? You know, for me, that doesn't change the outcome. Um, I, there was an incident at my home of violence that I witnessed. So even if that person wasn't responsible for her uh, life ending in that moment, I know and I saw with my own eyes. And the reason that I started to talk about it openly after her death was that I knew that <clears throat> there were a lot of other people who didn't know how to talk to a loved one who's in a domestic violence. And that's what happened with my sister and I. This incident happened at our home. And I said to her, thinking that tough love, you know, and that's kind of the culture that I'm from. And I said, you can do bad by yourself. Get rid of this guy, you know, this person. You don't need him. Look at you. Your life is on the up. And she had, you know, struggled with her sobriety, with alcohol. And I said, you've got this. And she was getting her life together, as they say. And she came to visit me. And she was so happy. And I was so proud. I'm like a big shot Chicago anchor. And I'm going to have her visit me. And he came with her. And uh, something happened in my home and I went downstairs and my home was torn apart and she had been um, attacked by him and I kicked him out of my home. The next morning I came downstairs to check on her to make sure she was okay. And he was back in my home and I'd felt such betrayal. Um, I, you know, and I was so angry with her, not because of anything other than I felt like she was way better than this. And how could you not know? Um, in my um, anger, I said, you know, you've got to leave and leave with him too. And I might call my dad and I'm like, how could she, you know, what, what's wrong with her and all of this. And we stopped speaking for a couple of months. And my dad, um, who's always like a no nonsense, it was like Thanksgiving. He was like, I'm not going to sit in this house and you two not speak to each other. So you need to call your sister now. Cause this is my dad. And I called her, she was getting a manicure and we just laughed it off, but we never dealt with it. We just, you know, let's glaze by it. And so Thankfully, we had resolved the differences and moved forward before she passed away. But I tell you that story and that my role as an advocate for survivors of domestic violence, it includes the family because we didn't know what to say. We we're a family of great love and great support, but we didn't know what to say. You know, I grew up when people used to say, that's somebody else's business. I remember when they used to say, well, don't call a police officer because police officers don't want to get involved with that. But I know now that that is not the case. I spoke before the New York City Police Department, sex violence crime. They were all eager to learn ways to connect to families and survivors of domestic violence. So the conversation has changed. We now know that adage of what happens in someone else's home is none of my business. It isn't unless it's domestic violence. And, and so I feel like through me sharing how hard it is as a family member and what do you do and what do you try to say to support that person uh, has been a, it's, it's, it's helped relieve great guilt, um, to be honest with you, and try to be there for families like yours who mentioned it in the note to me. So thank you so much for that. <clears throat> Cameron, what, what will your approach be to novel number three? Oh. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've already, I have the case in mind. Uh, it's a case that I covered a few years ago in Missouri. Uh, and it just never, it, it, it it's, it's um, a family case. And uh, I don't want to give too much away because I'm still working it out of my head. And if I, I say it and you're like, that's not what she said when she was visiting us. You tricked me again, Tamron. All oh, the interrupting chicken is missing or something. Um, so, but it's another case that I worked on. And I, I I'm toying now with, you know, as I said, Jordan, the vigilante, you know, I originally and not in a, you know, not in a way that she's going to create violence because that's not it. What I mean by that is 
how much of how much is she going to take on in the sense of truly breaking the rules in an effort to find what's right right because that's always that I I need her to be a compliment a complicated character because you say to yourself okay I see someone doing something wrong how far am I willing to go to fix that you know is she willing in her mind, I mean, think about it. She's in this scene, she's going through computers and it's illegal to break into someone's email, but would you break into someone's email if you knew it would save a life? You know, okay. Would you be willing to take someone and hold them if you knew they were about to commit a crime? Cause that's kidnapping. Right? So like, it's, it's that movie minority effect with Tom Cruise. Like, it's like, how far are you willing to go to keep someone from doing something bad? And does it make you bad in the end? And that's what I'm saying with vigilante, not someone who is going to go out. And I, you know, I, I grew up on like those Clint Eatwood movies, like Dirty Harry, you know, not that. Um, but this is, if you knew a child was being abused, would you take them? That's illegal. That's what I mean by I'm toying with how far you're willing to go to right a wrong. And does that move your moral compass? I know I need to get some sleep on it. <laughs> I'm telling my husband at the end of this book, he's like, what's going on with you? I'm like, it's the interrupting chicken. <laughs> That book, you're going to all look it up on Amazon. <laughs> it's a real book. It's like $14.99. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Talk Show host, executive producer, uh, board member, oh. award winner, award winner um, writer, yeah. mom. Uh, I saw you on, uh, I saw you with Joy Reid. Yeah. I saw you with George Stephanopoulos. Yeah. Uh, I think you were, were you on GMA? Also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, clearly, for book three, <laughs> one of your stops should be Stanford, Connecticut. Listen, um, I, I, I love being here. I'm going to tell you when I walked in and saw you all sitting here. It, I am. It, it's a pinch me moment, and I don't say that in in that like, oh shucks. I mean, I, I can't believe this is my life. You know, my mom was a 19 year old single mom before she married the dad that God meant for me to have. Um, Bill Webb is here from our sales team at ABC. I um, I am so grateful. I, I'm a crier, you know, and I cry a lot. I do. These lashes have extra glue today. Um, but I cry. These are truly like moments and tears of joy because I, we call you Tam fam, truly because I see you as my family. I think the best of us is that we root for others. But in return, we enjoy it when people root for us. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a selfish thing. So I, I relish in the fact that you root for me, that you're willing to give me a chance and read my thriller novel, that you ask me about my son, that you smile when you see me, and I hope you see my smile in return. I am so grateful. And y'all have this restaurant here, um, and I don't know the name of it, but we ordered it, and it's around the corner from where we um, tape, um, wherever Jerry's studio and all that is. Right. Oh, it's down the street. They have the biggest whole fish. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Fiestas. As long as Fiestas caters the next time we come. <laughs> I don't know who owns Fiesta, but tell them what's up, okay? <laughs> I think I've got several crews that we uh, cruised by. So uh, we can't thank you enough oh, for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you to the great Emerson Coleman. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So on the half of the Friends of the Ferguson and the Ferguson Library, uh, Ms. Hall and Mr. Coleman, we really like to thank you. Um, there will be a book signing. And if anybody needs additional books, the Elm Street 
bookstore is over there waving. And we also want to remind you that the Domestic Violence Crisis Center, there's someone here from that staff. If you'd like to stop by their table, she's waving as well. Thank you all for coming out and participating. <laughs> Oh,